Go ahead and get us started. I'm Teresa Mangum, and I'm the director at the Oberman Center for Advanced Studies at the University of Iowa, and I'm very happy to be a member of the public network of CHCI, as you all now are by default for joining us. Um, we're a very open and inclusive group. So uh, as you know, today we wanted to talk about with you, but also to learn from you, um, ways to do public and publicly engaged work well at our centers. And we're really sad that Irena had to uh, had, was not able to join us due to a family emergency. But I'll start off, well, first, let me just say a huge thank you to Nicholas Allen, who uh, has been the driving force behind the public network and has just done such a great job of organizing us. Um, and Aaron Fay of CHCI is always keeping us on track. He's guiding the Zoom today, so we're so grateful to him too. And to um, Nicholas's staff colleagues, um, Dave Marr and Winnie Smith, who's also uh, um, gonna be a panelist today. And I say panel, but what we have in mind is that we'll talk a little bit about what we do at our centers and how we how we go about thinking about setting up relationships and public events. But then we will be delighted to just shift into conversational mode and not only take questions, but learn from you, because I'm sure you're all doing great things, too. And um, and actually, we're a small enough group that we could pop, probably do really quick introductions if we just want to go around. So let me have the panelists introduce themselves first, and then we'll just ask the rest of you to say a quick hello. And Winnie, you want to start us off? Sure. Thanks, Teresa. Thank you for having me. I'm Winnie Smith. I'm at the University of Georgia Wilson Center for Humanities and Arts, and I'm the associate director here. Thank you. And Kylie? Thanks, Teresa, um, and thanks also to Nicholas and Aaron. Um, my name is Kylie Message-Jones. I'm the director of the Humanities Research Centre at the Australian National University. And we're so grateful to Kylie for managing time zones to make it possible for her to join us. I'm just going to call... I also actually just noticed that one of my colleagues is is also on the line, but I think that he might be um, driving kids around to school because it's eight o'clock in the morning. So <laughs> I'm not, not sure how much he can contribute, but. That's heroic. Um, and just quickly, um, Guillaume, you wanna start, introduce yourself? Uh, sure, uh, I'm Guillaume Rattel. I'm the executive director of CHCI and I'm a fly on the wall here. Uh, always happy to learn from this network which, which does great, great work, so. Thank you. Jamie? Hi, everyone. I'm Jamie Alberg. I'm the new director at the Center for Humanities and Public Sphere at University of Florida. Oh, that's wonderful. Congratulations. Oh, uh, Gabriella? Hi there. I am the new associate director of the Humanities Research Center at Rice University. Great. Welcome. Mary? I'm guessing I'm the only one. Uh, I'm Mary P. Sheridan. I'm at the University of Louisville. We're at, the, we're at the Commonwealth Center for Humanities and Society. And I'm really excited to see so many people here, particularly at a time when um, the humanities are under such attack. Uh, and I know people in this Florida can relate to that, but I think people lots of places will. So I'm really anxious to hear what everyone's doing. Thank you. Sarah? Hi everyone, I'm Sara Turne and I'm a research grants program director at the University of California Humanities Research Institute. I was a mouthful. And I will just say that it's nice to see some faces from Chile here. Yes, indeed. Courtney. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Courtney Hobson. I'm program manager at the Drescher Center for the Humanities at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Welcome. And Lauren. Hi everyone, I'm Lauren Cox and I'm the Assistant Director of the Oberman Center and I work with Teresa. Amy. Hey, hello. Uh, so my name is Amy Germain. I'm the Program Manager for the Central New York Humanities Corridor, which is an 11 institution consortium based at Syracuse University. Thank you. And Christopher? Hi, I'm Chris Boberg. I'm the Assistant Director at the Interdisciplinary Humanities Center at the University of California, Santa Barbara. 
Great. And Rex. Hi, friends. I'm Rex Nielsen from the uh, BYU Humanity Center. I'm the director there. Thank you. Nice to see you. Kim? Uh, you're, hello, everyone. I'm uh, Kylie's deputy at the Humanities Research Center um, at the Australian National University. She's spot on, but I'm in between making uh, lunches and jumping in the car, but really glad to uh, interface with you all. <laughs> Thank you for making the effort. That's impressive. Saskia? Hi, so nice to see everyone. Um, I'm Saskia Namberg dunkel I work at the Humanities Institute at UC Santa Cruz. I'm the Research Programs and Communications Manager. Might have my camera off and be a little quieter today because today, I'm actually uh, a bit sick, but I really wanted to participate in the conversation and hear from you all. So um, nice to see some familiar faces and, and meet um, new folks in the network as well. Great. Uh, Kian, let me know that, that it's not a good time to try to have a conversation. Melinda, did you want to introduce yourself? I know you might be traveling also. Good morning, I'm Melinda Takimura. I was having trouble with my video. Um, I'm working as a centre administrator with Kali Message Jones at the ANU Humanities Research Centre. So thanks for having me today. Great, thank you. Okay, so what we thought we'd do is just start off by talking a little bit about the relationship at our different centres um, between our missions and the kind of public programming that we do. And uh, we thought we'd give a few examples. And actually, I, I, we could we could do this as we go. One of the things I always like to share or learn is an easy way to do something with low resources, low staff, you know, few staff, and then the more complicated projects that are that demand greater resources and are deeply rewarding as a result. But um, so I wonder if, uh, Wendy, do you want to start us off talking about some of the public programming that you do and how it furthers your mission? Sure. Um, our public programming, I mean, it's really built into our mission of promoting research, practice, and creativity in the humanities and arts. And so part of supporting faculty and graduate students, um, one way is through grants, and the other way is helping them have public events, conferences, exhibits, um, conversations, and performances. So it's really just built into the fabric of what we do. Um, and I thought a little bit, I hope I'm not jumping too far ahead, but um, you know, you mentioned using just a little bit of resources. Um, we work with local school districts, whether we are taking speakers and performers to their auditorium or bringing students here. Um, we have a small team here. There's only four of us. Um, I work with Nicholas Allen, for those of you who I haven't met before. Um, but just providing students that opportunity, the cost seems to be relatively small. And we try to absorb whatever we can if we can help with transportation. Um, but just that opportunity to meet with writers, either in a small group setting here at the Wilson Center or participate in hands-on art activities like we've done at the art school or, um, like I said, attending a talk or a performance in their auditorium, you know, sometimes taking the event to the public schools just makes a really big impact um, and gives them a chance to engage with visitors. So I hope that's helpful. Yeah, that's a great start. Um, Kali, do you want to offer an example? Yeah, sure. So um, most of you will be unaware of the Humanities Research Centre at the ANU, obviously. Um, we're, we've been around for a long time. We're about 50 years old. And the centre has a fairly traditional background. Even though it's always been involved in interdisciplinary research, it's always been interdisciplinary research around kind of the edges of the canon. So in the last few years, when um, I came on as director, we wanted to expand the focus from research excellence to uh, public engagement, public impact, and working with partnerships. Partly we did that because we're also a really small team. It's basically me, Kim and Melinda, who you've just met briefly. Um, so whenever we do any kind of programming, we try and get multiple outcomes. So um, that means that whether it's a small program or a large program, it's always involving multiple stakeholders, multiple partners, and we try and um, kind of gain some kind of impact right across the scholarly spectrum from research excellence all the way out into community work and whatever. Um, partnerships are our biggest kind of um, 
focus, I suppose. And so the example that I would give is one of the programs that I've developed with the National Museum of Australia, which is the Summer Scholars Program. And it's probably more on the, the complex end or the time intensive end. But what we do is we ask questions about what research looks like in different environments. And we bring together scholars who work across the museum and university sectors to understand and ask questions about what research is for them in those places. So I'm happy to talk more about that, but that's just a brief introduction. And I'll just toss in a couple of examples too. Um, and I'm gonna go at the low end. We're also a small center and most of what we are able to accomplish is through collaboration. But, um, and and our mission like Holly's it has, is, is technically more traditional. We are supposed to support the research, interdisciplinary research, including and especially humanities research on campus, but much broader mandate than that. And so, one of the ways I think about our public work is how to help scholars learn how to communicate what they do more more persuasively, more accessibly to broader publics, which we really we really need in Iowa with our very, you know, with our legislators who are always um, complaining about higher ed. So we started a program last year that we call Wide Lens, and it's. Um, at uh, an art museum in the community and uh, we have a theme so we just had one on AI and I ask about six seven um, faculty members who are working the theme from across the university to put together a Pecha Kucha do you all know that format it's when 20 slides 20 seconds per slide and you don't get to like it you just start the clock and it goes and so uh, Lauren has been our wonderful uh, wrangler in putting the slides together, and we asked the faculty members who do it to um, rehearse, so we're really training them in how to think about presentation, how to come up with PowerPoint slides that are actually visually exciting, how to narrate the story of research, and we've been having over 100 people show up for these and, for, you know, just riveted, and and it it's it's a kind of public facing work, but it really gives scholars a whole new way to feel like their work's important to people outside specialization. It's been a lot of fun too. Um, and the other thing I'm just gonna drop in the chat, we, I, I hadn't thought about this until I was planning for today, but we started several years ago, whenever, you know, thinking about how to help others, other groups on campus as well as off campus, with the kinds of things that our center does really well, like publicity and organizing events. And so we have this page of resource guides that we put together that are open for anybody. And some are very local, but some are focused on things like how to do publicity for an event. And we share it around campus and the community. And um, the one that I think is especially pertinent to what we're talking about with mission right now is way down at the bottom and it's called the sieve. And it's just a list of questions that when we're thinking about taking on a new project, we put with the staff goes through together. So we think about how does this um, attach to mission, further mission, how does this, uh, what resources are gonna be involved, who could we partner with? And it's just been a really helpful decision-making tool for all kinds of things, including public public um, work. So just wanted to share that in case it's helpful to you all. Um, and that actually is a good transition. We've already been talking about the question of resources. And I'll ask this and then open things up to, to all of you. Um, the the uh, Kali and Winnie, how do you, when you're taking on a project, and especially these big exciting projects like the museum exhibition, how do you figure out support and financial and staff support? What's your magic secret sauce? You want to start, Kylie? Sure. Um, we plan uh, the year in advance, roughly speaking. So we have um, a budget that primarily goes to visiting fellows. Uh, our primary purpose, kind of, I, I suppose, institutionally, 
is to bring um, visiting fellows from interstate and international universities to come to the ANU to network and uh, collaborate with our researchers. So I've already got a big bucket for that and then I've got an events bucket and we do that in advance, as I say, pretty roughly, but that just means, you know, we'll put a bigger amount for a larger event like a conference um, and then we'll put aside smaller amounts for things that might come up. But in reality, a lot of our programs and actions are very cheap. I mean, they're not cheap in terms of people. Uh, and human resources, but they don't cost a lot because we are pretty responsive and we're pretty reactive and agile and we just kind of do things as the need arises or as the idea arises. And we need to be agile like that because we've got such a, um, a mobile population of visiting fellows and honorary staff and visitors coming through that if someone comes through and has a great idea for a workshop, we might want to do it. So we do it. So that's a bit of a vague answer, but we're we're pretty kind of like. Uh, uh. I have a feeling it's how a lot of things happen at a lot of our centers. Um, Wendy, did you want to add? Yeah, I was going to say similarly to Kylie um, at A and U, and I can hear myself echoing. I apologize. Nicholas left his door open, so I hear myself oh. twice. <laughs> Um, but we do have to plan a year in advance. So any of our public impact grants or department invited lecturers our fellows, all of that, we receive those proposals a good year before, um, I mean, the awards are even funded. So a lot of that's planned, um, like we're planning now for next academic year. Um, we also receive nominations like for our Delta Visiting Chair for Global Understanding, that'll come in about six months before. So there's a lot of leeway. I mean, there's different sources of funds, um, but there's a lot of advanced planning. We do have last minute things that pop up. Um, we'll have our Spotlight on the Arts events. We might think of something that we want to add to that program and then reach out to some other partners on Arts Council, like the Georgia Review or the Art School or the Music School and put together a program with them. So there are, like Kylie was saying, there are things that we host and have our own events and entertainment funds, and then we'll ask other units to chip in. Just kind of depends on what the program is. Thank you. And um, Mary asks um, the always important question, where our resources come from? And I'll say at Iowa as a state institution um, that come from, and, and we report to the vice president for research. A lot of humanities centers report to deans instead. So the vice president for research funds our four staff positions. Two of them are just 50%, so a small staff. But that the VPR covers those salaries. And then we have an endowment. Thank you, thank you, Professor Oberman. Um, and the program activities, and it's a small amount. It's like 120,000 a year. The program activities come from there. <clears throat> and then we leverage that by working with lots of people, other groups on campus. We've been fortunate to have Mellon grants for the last several years that have let us really build in other layers and more public facing layers, but those are coming to an end. Um, so, so that's how we've worked. Um, Kali, how are you guys financed? How did you? Yeah, you we're also funded through the university. Um, I won't try and explain Australian government university funding. However, we're funded through something that was historically called a block grant. And what that means is that the funding came direct to the from the government to our university and was, in our case, was ring-fenced fenced for the HRC. That's changed a little bit, but we've still effectively maintained uh, funding through the from the government through the, the centre down to us. Um, but one of the reasons that we do so much partnership work is not just because it's great and it extends our you know like little octopus hands to reach lots of different communities <laughs> and have greater impact but it's because we do a lot of joint funded activities and we do joint funded fellowships um you know we do all sorts of things and if you split a co the costs for something suddenly it becomes quite manageable usually but um also most recently we've um had some funding from the chci membership 
fund. So that's been really fabulous. Um, we haven't started that project yet, but that's a reasonably small bucket of money that's available for all members to apply for. And it's really great. I mean, that's going to allow us to do work with 15 regional and rural universities across Australia, and they have like access to no funding at all. So small buckets can go a long way. And I think, we, you know, you could also, I can imagine with that new membership fund um, that Erin is running for the organization that with the membership committee, you know, you could go to your own university and say, if we get one of these $5,000 grants, would you be willing to match that? I mean, you know, we should all think creatively about how to stretch those dollars even further. But yes, all centers that are members are eligible to apply. Winnie, how about you all? Yeah, thank you, Mary, for the question. This is um, what I do <laughs> all day. Uh, we have lots of different pots, just like um, Teresa was saying, we are endowed. We're the Wilson Center, so we're named after the Wilson family, so we have that endowment. We also have a non-endowed account that's for our general giving, um, just non-restrictive funds, we do receive state funds for our staff payroll. Um, that also goes to support our fellowships and a little bit of administrative costs. Um, but mostly uh, we get research funds. We get money from the UGA Research Foundation and a little bit of IDC return. If any departments chip in, um, like we have some support for a salary or our graduate research awards, that comes to us from tuition money. So we don't have tuition because we're a research center. Like Teresa was saying, we also um, are under the VP for research, but the colleges, the provost office, if they send us money, it's in a tuition pot. So we have a lot of little bits everywhere. And there's our Mellon grant. We have a big Mellon grant, our partnership with the Penn Center in South Carolina. So resources everywhere. Yeah. And one of the things that I suspect we'll be doing at Oberman for the next few years is, is being much more um, attentive to even small local grants, state level grants, uh, as well as, you know, looking at foundations, because it is amazing how you can, what we're all capable of doing with five or $10,000 is actually kind of extraordinary. I wonder, do other people have public programs that they'd like to share or talk about <clears throat> or questions you'd like to ask? We were, uh, the next question we're headed toward is how programs evolve when you start a pro small public program and it starts to grow. I love the octopus um, image, Kylie. But before we go in that direction, um, are there projects that you all would share or want to share? Yeah, Rex. I'm happy to share one. It's it's nascent, so this is this is very new. But um, over the summer, I went and visited the local municipal library in the city where our university is located, and um, had a meeting with the director of the library. I wanted she was new. I wanted to meet her and just talk about how we might uh, how our center could maybe support some of the programming going on at the library and. She was excited to say, oh, yes, we'd love to have you maybe send some scholars over to talk, you know, in Black History Month in February or Women's History Month in March. And yes, that's, you know, that's easy for us to arrange for some faculty to go over and, and share their expertise. But she said what we'd really like, though, is um, something that's more like participatory. Is there is there what could you offer us that might help us engage the public rather than them sitting and listening, is there something that they could do? And um, I think she was thinking about like, I don't know, some kind of a workshop or I, I don't know exactly what she she meant, but it got me thinking. And um, we've decided to start uh, a new lab in our center and we're calling it the Provo Walks Lab. Provo is the name of the city where we're based. And we've enlisted 25 different faculty members to design a walk related to some aspect of the culture, history, experience, human experience of where we live. And so I have a colleague in indigenous studies who's designing a walk that highlights places of indigenous history in the city. And he works with our local, um, the local, um, 
uh, you know, Native American populations of, of our community. Uh, Provo was also the site to a Japanese internment camp um, in back in the 40s. And so we're having a walk being designed around that history. But we're, you know, but we also have a walk coming from international cinema people about the the, the films that were filmed in, in, in this location. And we're very close to Sundance and where Sundance happened. And so um, we've we're we're all kind of excited about how we can share expertise, ex creating these walks that can then so we're creating a suite of walks that can then be um, used by the public and housed at our local library. And um, I'm I, I'm curious to see where this leads us and what what kind of scholarship might evolve from it as we try to engage with our local community population. That's a great project. Yeah, I can imagine that students, classes being involved in projects like that too. Yeah, really. lots of students, yeah, enlisted to help. So these yeah. will be kind of class class based project types of things. Other folks have examples. Yeah, um, Saskia. Yeah, I was just going to share really briefly one of our projects and also um, kind of leads into a question that I have for the group. Um, so we have a program called our Public Fellows Program, which matches both undergraduate students and graduate students with outside organizations to explore how their humanities scholarship uh, can benefit the organizations and also in turn, you know, the work of the organization prepare them for a wide range of careers. And, you know, for example, for our PhD students, it can enhance their dissertation research. And so they can be really nicely connected to the scholarship they're doing. Um, with this outside organization. And I'll put um, a link in the chat. We actually just published an article on UCSC News about the program. We have a new video um, that shows the students and all the types of placements they've had from working at museums to working with you know, publishing groups, um, historical sites, et cetera. Um, and this is kind of a, a question for the group about sort of student engagement in um, these public humanities projects, both undergraduate and graduate students. And you know, I'd love to hear some examples from other institutes and centers of how that's worked and what kind of support you've had on your campus um, for, for both the PhD students and, and undergraduate student involvement. Um, anybody want to start that off with that? Uh, Winnie or Kylie, do you all have programs for you? You were already talking, Winnie, about the ways you involve work with students. Um, do you have, is that a formal kind of wing of the center? It's not, it's just, we have worked with Clark County School District. Um, that's specifically our local public schools. And I, I can answer um, Saskia's question a little better with the UGA students. But if we have something significant coming that we think would be a good fit and would be just be a really dynamic learning experience for Clark County Schools, then we reach out to them. Um, or sometimes they'll reach out to us like, hey, don't forget us. We've got some great seniors this year. And I mean, we're happy to do it. They're right down the street. It's, it's just, we have a really, really good uh, communication with them. Um, as far as UGA students, I actually was just thinking of this long-term program that we've had with Hands House Studio out of Massachusetts. Um, they are a group that does historical reconstructions. And we've been able to work with them on several projects um, that have involved master's students. And um, we don't have a PhD in fine arts here, but um, undergrads, and they've come in 2015 for a film screening. They did a virtual panel in 2022. They did a workshop in last fall, and then they're going to be coming again in the spring. So we, whether it's signups or it's just open to the public, I mean, anything we can do to spread the word and partner with a school or a college to get student participation, I mean, we're all in. Thank you. And Kali, do you all work with undergrad with students? We don't have an education program in the center um, like um, the others. We're a research center. But I'm very um, committed to research training across different levels. So um, we do um, graduate workshops every couple of years or year, depending on capacity. Um, and that will also be tied to an annual conference usually and connected to an annual theme because we have annual themes. Um, the other thing that we do, which is what I was talking about earlier, is the uh, summer scholars program with the National Museum of Australia and that's a small program but it brings uh it brings senior undergraduate students to 
Canberra, which is where we're based, and we tend to uh, we encourage uh, First Nations, uh, regional and rural students to that program who wouldn't otherwise have the opportunity to come and work in the national institutions. And in the program that we did last year, we looked at how do you do research training that's uh, rigorous but that will lead to either a PhD program, so it will be you know, it'll have the specific disciplinary requirements that could be needed for a PhD program in a discipline like history or anthropology, but that would also give some skills in material-based uh, learning. Um, and that program, which runs for about two months, it's very intensive. Uh, it has a number of outcomes that we work towards. So last year, the students developed um, public presentations, which they delivered at the National Museum, uh, they all ended up having uh, peer-reviewed articles, which I mentored them into to, to, with. Um, there were public blogs. They made a digital calendar as a as a group project. Um, following the program, they established an activism and literature book club, which was a public book club open for anybody but primarily it was really intended just as a mode of continued contact between them and and me and the group um and in oh and in fact I just remembered that one of the students who was part of that group um Evelyn Lambeth actually came to CHCI conference last year and was awarded a scholarship to do so. So this program, which is quite intensive, is focused on research training for senior undergraduate students, but its impact is very expansive. It's it's a very successful program. That sounds wonderful. Mary, did you have your hand up? I was just going to describe, we do some things with uh, undergrads. Uh, we have a uh, internship program with the Louisville Cultural Partners. And so it really depends on what the student match versus what the institution need is. The nice thing about that is when we work, it's every spring. So we have ongoing relationships and they know, and they're very good mentors and they're very small groups. So some things might be, um, what do you do with the indigenous artifacts that the that the museum has? How do you catalog them? How do you treat them with respect? How, what do you do with that? Um, how do you create educational programming? So we've got someone from education. We've got someone from museum studies. We have somebody, um, we're doing something with a public media station. So a lot of what we do is, is that ongoing relationship with a community partner. And then we hope to get a faculty, they have to have a faculty member sponsor for that student. So in that way, we're trying to thicken the connections with community and faculty, hoping that that can lead to more organic community partnerships. Um, and students get a great experience often getting jobs out of that. We had somebody work with a lot of film and they did a lot. Um, they end up going to film school and getting really good job out in NYU. So those are the types of programs of trying to, I think what you were saying earlier, Teresa, is how do you spin this multiple ways? And, and that's been an area where we've had success, if that helps. Yeah, that's great. Um, one other program that we have that's small, but, um, every year our center, um, hosts a conference, uh, you know, a symposium that faculty apply for and, and they plan with us. And, um, uh, before COVID, we haven't resumed this, but we need to get back to this. We would add, we would give the faculty directors of the symposium a little more money to run a one hour graduate course for the symposium. And so they would meet two hours for, you know, five weeks or whatever, and then attend the symposium. Uh, and in that five weeks, they would read articles by the people who would be speaking at the symposium or see their artwork, or whatever. So that meant that 15 or so people, stu students, would enter the conference really knowledgeable about work. And in that five weeks, we also always ask the faculty members to spend some time with the students talking about what is a good question? How do you frame a good question when you go to your speaker instead of just lecturing back to them or telling them what you would, they, you know, how you would do their project? 
Um, and that really makes such a difference in their sense of confidence in, in attending the symposium and, and makes us look really great because they're so well informed. And they usually they don't have any graded assignments, just pass fail, but they also usually have some activity they do like they used to tweet the conference back when there was such a thing as Twitter, or they uh, blog about events they're attending. And the best thing about that is it means student grad students from across a number of disciplines get to meet each other. And that is such a pleasure for them um, to, to build that cohort and that set of relationships. So that's that's one of the ways we've worked with students. The, um, we don't have undergraduate programs, so we often talk about that. But I think we'd have to really build our capacity to do that re responsibly as we are now. Are there are there others who have programs that you'd like to talk about at your center that involve students? Yeah, um, Amy. Okay, thank you. Um, so I, I will say, so the Syracuse University Humanities Center does do um, kind of the co-sponsored things with the Downtown Writers Center in Syracuse. So there is like a writing series every year and they, um, incorporate our humanity center theme for the year and do an event on that front. And there's a few other community organizations that do that kind of work. Um, but I was really hoping, uh, my colleague Jacqueline Ladnier was hoping to join today along with Bryce Northquist. I'm sorry that they weren't able to make it today, but I do just want to hype their program that they're working on, which is the H Engaged Humanities Network at Syracuse University. Um, and this is a program that, that is entirely focused on getting faculty, undergraduate students, and graduate students involved and engaged and excited about doing community work. But it's it's kind of set up in a decentralized way. So like people's ideas are what kind of filter up. It's like very ground up um, oriented. And I'm not going to do as great of a job talking about it as they would. <laughs> but just really quickly, um, there is an undergraduate research component, which is brings undergrads together to kind of brainstorm and work with like faculty and get projects off the ground. There's a graduate research component that helps fund graduate students who are interested in doing this kind of work. There's an engaged communities program, which is about getting faculty and student teams to kind of go out and do projects. Uh, they meet and then do like one showcase event every year. There's an environmental storytelling component um, where they do, I think four public events every year with a performance and a workshop and they team up with high schools uh, and undergraduate students and they create learning guides it's a little bit more involved i think the pro this program is being developed and there is a lot of excitement and interest about it but i think it is a work in progress um, and then there's an engaged courses component to it which is a group of uh, five faculty that meet several times a year and they share materials and talk about how to incorporate kind of community engagement into their coursework. It sounds like a lot of you are doing this kind of work, like incorporating this into the curriculum, which is really just interesting to hear and learn more about what groups are doing. But I will put the link in the chat um, so that you can see the awesome work. That's that great. And, and I appreciate others who've been putting things in the chat too. We'll gather those and, and share those back out with the larger network. Thank y'all. Um, Winnie. Yep, I was just going to share one more example, and I'll put a link in the chat as well. And thank you, um, Teresa, for saying you would share these because I'm writing them down as y'all are um, <laughs> posting them. We have this partnership at the Penn Center that I mentioned, um, our Mellon grant earlier. It's called Culture and Community at the Penn Center. This is not just for UGA students, but UGA students and faculty are invited to participate, um, undergraduate or graduate, but mostly undergraduate. Um, they go to the Penn Center for student research residencies every spring. So we had one cohort, and then last year we had two cohorts, and this year, this coming spring, they wanted to have three cohorts, but we've talked them down to two. But I mean, I think we're going to probably have 40 students each week. It just grows every year. And the students come from HBCUs all over the South, um, College of Charleston, Augusta, Morehouse, and Spelman. And it's really a great way for them to meet each other and collaborate and network and the faculty get to work together. And it's just the most wonderful experience. I'm just happy to tag along and be there with them. That sounds wonderful. 
others who who want to share or questions that you have for us or for each other? So I'll miss that. Um, well, while you're thinking about that, uh, another program, uh, again, I'm thinking about maybe it's the time of year, but I'm thinking about the lower stakes end of the programs, um, as well as the more uh, really exciting, well-developed programs. And Lauren, I wonder if you would tell the group about our Oberman Conversations program. I think that's another one. The Public Library made me think about that because they're often our partner in activities. Mm -hmm. Sure. So um, I run a program called Oberman Conversations that pairs typically two faculty members with two members of the community in conversation on a particular topic at the public library. And the public library is a great partner in this regard because they also record the conversations and broadcast them live on their YouTube channel. So we have um, a community involvement that way. And um, this past semester, we had some really great ones around kind of, I wanted to think about what are topics that are really important right now to discuss in the community. So we had one about book banning and book banning in Iowa that was really well attended and um, really important. And then also one about strikes that we did um, last week that was actually also very well attended. We had some local labor leaders who were in the conversation with um, a historian of labor and um, the other thing that I've been encouraging with this is um, helping them, the speakers think about how to talk, how the community can get involved and kind of having this community involvement component and talking about that during the conversation. And um, I think that has been something that's been really great and uh, just uh, kind of having this campus community collaboration start. It's also really a great program for reminding faculty of other forms of expertise and the broad expertise all around us in the community, um, which I think is kind of ground the ground for building the possibility for collaborations that involve the community in a, in a mutually respectful way. Other, um, well, uh, actually, the the person who was going to talk about this most was Irena, because they've done such a great job. But one of the things that Irena mentioned that maybe some of you could help us by talking about is the way that a lot of their most, uh, their really exciting programs started with these kinds of small collaborations in public, and then those turned into relationships that made it possible to develop more imaginative, capacious projects. And I just wonder if any of you have examples of that kind of, of transformation. Um, I don't mean to put you on the spot, Pat, but you guys do such great work at Chapel Hill. I wonder what kinds of projects you have underway uh, these days. <laughs> Well, you sort of are putting me on the spot a bit. I'm <laughs> sorry. <Teresa. laughs> um, you know, I'm um, our um, colleagues from the the Center for Public Humanities is not on this call, uh, CPH, but they are really the leaders, um, and we sort of and we do collaborate on. Uh, some projects, but but they they're the ones who are doing. They have the public humanities fellows. Um, um, they are um, have just gotten some really uh, great funding to have student undergraduate students um, who are doing um, public human who are paired with faculty member uh, mentors, and we did we so collaborated on that. Uh, with them in having fellows at the Institute for the Arts and Humanities to serve as some of the mentors because we do have faculty who are doing their individual research. So um, they are really the leaders on our campus in doing um, the public humanities um, work. But with that said, um, I will say that, um, you know, um, most of our work, um, you know, we're the intellectual home for faculty in the arts and humanities on our campus. So, so most of what we do is to support individual faculty by bringing them to the, the Institute to in these interdisciplinary conversations, but really we're trying to amplify their work 
going out. So it's really about, um, you know, so that's that that makes us a little different from other um, other um, um, centers that that um, host their own programming. Mm -hmm. We do. Um, so this is sort of a headline for you, Aaron. <laughs> To know that this is coming down the pike, I'm, we're we're uh, currently finishing up our application for a global humanities institute. Uh, that we're that that deadline is coming up, and um, Teresa, as you know, my work is in engaged scholarship, so I'm I'm leaning into that um, part of my own scholarship to help shape a collaboration with centers um, around you know globally. Um, and it will be a kind of a public humanities theme. So I don't want to give away <laughs> kind of because we're still sort of developing that. Um, so anyway, I'm not sure if that responds to, to your, your question, but that's, that's, that's some of the, that's sort of the way that we approach public humanities. We're always looking for these opportunities to, to amplify the work of individual faculties and then faculty. And then we're also doing some partnerships with CPH and then doing uh, this new project that we hope will get funded uh, through a global uh, public, um, uh, sorry, uh, Global Humanities Institute. That's great, Pat. Thank you. And Kali, you were going to jump in. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, raise another issue, which is around the nomenclature of public humanities, because that seems to be very uh, common in the US, but it's not at all common in Australia. Um, and it's useful for us to use that terminology primarily, well, I mean, it, it's a good, descript good descriptor, but um, also it allows us to have conversations about, you know, what is public humanities and who is it for and how does it work and how do we do scholarship around public humanities as well as engaged research. So um, I just thought it might be useful to feed that information back that, you know, it's not a, it's not really a thing here in the way that it is in the US, and that enables us to have these conversations in different contexts about what research is for and what knowledge is and who makes knowledge and how does it function in the world. <clears throat> That's such a great point, um, and uh, and I think in the states we also tend to slip around by. Um, using public humanities to mean a range of things that are actually quite different from one another. So I think I, I try to use the language myself of public facing humanities and then of engaged scholarship or publicly engaged scholarship. And, and others in other fields would talk about community-based scholarship, community-based research. Pat, I'm sure you have a really precise sense of this range of terms, but it's a real challenge for, for me and the university, and I suspect for a lot of us, that our administrators often use the word engaged to mean something really different from research with partners. They mean they mean attracting students. I mean, they can mean any number of things. And so that asking people to be precise about terminology and talking our way to some kind of shared understanding, I think is one of the critical st steps in every project when we're trying to talk about are you planning a public facing project or are you going to, you know, is it really a partnership? That's an ongoing struggle at my school, at least. The language of translation is very uh, big here. And often when our university leaders talk about research translation, they mean how do you explain the impact of your scholarship to a non-academic audience? And I struggle with this all the time because I, always kind of reiterate that translation is a two-way process and research in the fields in which I work at least has to be um, multiple. It has to have meaning to more than one person, whether it's public facing or um, academic, uh, that, that that partnership has to have out outcomes that are meaningful and interactive for each partner. 
In, absolutely. And and one of the, this is a little bit veering to the side, but related, I think, one of the things we discovered this semester that I'm just fascinated and frankly horrified by is that we have a whole group of working groups at the Oberman Center. This is another it, relatively inexpensive and really meaningful thing you, that many of you probably are already doing. So um, groups can apply. They have to have at least six people and at least one faculty organizer, but then otherwise they can be community partners, they can be students, grad students, all sorts of people. And they apply to work together for a year and all. they have to meet three times each semester for 90 minutes. And that's the only requirement, just that they meet that often. And if you look on our website, we have the 40 this year, it's kind of insane, on every conceivable topic. And some of those groups do, um, some are just reading groups, which is great. Some are workshops, but others are writing grants together, writing papers together and doing community projects with partners. And the part that horrified me is I learned this, this year that many of the faculty, the 200 faculty members in those groups list their work in the working group as service because they didn't have a sense that there's a space to talk about that work as research. This drives me crazy. So Lauren and I are currently surveying all the people in the working groups to get a sense of how do you register this kind of research, the kind of research you're doing, whether it's a, a reading group or whether it's a a publicly engaged project, as several of them are. And we're going to really try to come up with some recommendations to help people find ways to speak about work that's not publication and so unfamiliar to their colleagues as research, which I think is critical for a center like ours. Winnie? Oh, I think you're muted. Sorry about that. I clicked lower hand and I thought I'd click unmute. Oh. <laughs> um, I'm glad you brought up your working groups. Um, we have had a couple of years of mentors and fellow support groups where we have a dozen faculty who meet together. They read each other's proposals. This is for external grant support. Um, they basically hold each other accountable. They meet here at the Wilson Center. They have one faculty leader. They do all of this online and in person. Um, and out of those meetings and out of our meetings with new faculty in humanities departments, we've started a writing group just this year. Um, we've gotten funding from a donor who provides snacks for the faculty. They meet once a month in the library and it grows every time. And it's just been a really great way for faculty to get together, write together, collaborate, meet each other, or just seek feedback if they've got a proposal in the works. Um, we did look at your working groups. It's such an incredible model, but I hope that helps. Yeah, and relative to, to, the, to the working groups and all kinds of other engaged practice, um, Kylie just asked a great question in the chat, which is, how, is there a discourse around non-traditional research processes and outcomes at your universities? or colleges. And I'm really curious for all of us, how, how do your colleagues, how do you report public facing work, but also especially engaged work when you're doing work in partnership that just doesn't sit in traditional categories of print publication for the most part? How do you all talk about that work to make it legible to the people who give you money, for example, the administrators. I, I, I can speak to that a bit, uh, Teresa. This is a really robust um, conversation on our campus, actually. Um, we have um, um, in our tenure code at the level of, of the provost, um, two pathways to tenure that relate to the digital humanities and engaged scholarship. And they, um, you know, the way that, that our campus arrived at having that sort of institutionalization of that, you know, that kind of uh, research, which are two categories of research that can, can count as, you know, what we call public humanities or engaged scholarship or um, 
there's also this notion of applied scholarship. You know, these all these all this nomenclature really sort of um, is floating around, but. Um, the way we arrived at that, you know, <laughs> is through the, the traditional um, fo bureaucratic forms. There's a task force that makes a report. Um, and usually this is guided by our APT, our, our um, um, uh, appointments and promotion and, uh, and, and tenure committee saying, here are these files coming through. We don't know what to do with them. And then... So we've had probably two or three um, task force that responded to these refinements of what we mean by this kind of scholarship. Um, I'd say probably starting in um, maybe 10 years ago. Um, and <clears throat> I personally have been involved in some of these conversations on our campus in terms of, in my, in my own discipline, what we think about as participatory research and precisely the kinds of uh, commitments that you talked about. Um, I can't remember, Teresa, you raised it, but I can't remember um, our, our colleague from, from Australia, you raised it and I'm not seeing you on the in the boxes right now, but this idea of, um, you know, what counts as knowledge, what counts as expertise and how we're, we're framing that, um, uh, you know, the production of knowledge. And then, you know, what does peer review mean when you're talking about something outside the academy or in partnership uh, if, with communities, um, you know, collaborating with people in the, uh, in, um, in, in the academy. So these are questions that we're grappling with. Um, I wrote a paper about that's called Decolonizing the Academy that was basically a um, sort of an intervention uh, on that question of, <clears throat> You know how how are we co-producing knowledge with uh, people who have expertise? Um, you know, in the very power structures that we're trying to critique, uh, the, these are people who are engaged in those those and living through those conditions, uh, those critical um, um, conditions all the time. So that that's yeah, that's my and, response. And Pat, maybe we could catch up with you after um, to get a link to that article, but also if there are policies on your website that talk about things that people, you know, who've done digital scholarship or public scholarship language that they can use, that would be really helpful, I bet, to a lot of us in the network to take yeah. back to our universities as an example, that'd be wonderful. I'd be happy to provide that. I'm the worst at multitasking on these Zoom calls of finding the, I'm very impressed with people who know how to do those, to put their hands on links, to put them in chats, but I will definitely do my best to, to do some of that. And, but, but to get that information to you, Teresa. That would be fantastic. And I'll just, I just want to jump in really quickly. I know that um, other people have their hands up, so I'm, I apologize. But um, there's really great work that's being done in the UK around uh, impact and measuring impact. Uh, so there's lots of resources on various websites around that regarding the REF process that they have over there. So if anybody's looking, they can just do a Google search for that. Thank you. Is that the report that um, was shared last summer at in Chile that... That no, from... no, it's okay. tied. It's tied to the Times Higher Education rankings mm -hmm. um, information, so that's probably a good place to start. And maybe again, we can grab some links there that we can yeah, share. Yeah, I can them. find. Them. Yeah, that'd be wonderful. Um, we're right at the end of our time, but I see that Amy has a hand up. Amy, do you want to take us out? <laughs> No, I was just going to say like this, this issue had come up this week in a board meeting about like, how do we identify the markers of like what, what is valued um, in terms of like, how do we get the, ten how do we influence the tenure and promotion guidelines across our institutions so that people can do this work and feel rewarded and not feel like, like they're having to do something extra because this is really valuable work and trying to prove outcomes in assessment speak is often a big challenge. Um, so trying to find ways to do this is uh, incredibly important so that, that we can all keep doing this, this kind of and, impactful work. And it is, you know, it's helpful to me that, that the kind of organizations my colleagues <clears throat> respect, like the Modern Language Association, the American Historical Society, 
the American, uh, the uh, ACLS, that a number of the Council of Learned Societies, a number of those groups are now, you know, have put out guides to evaluating public work and statements in support of engaged work. And so I think, you know, pulling those resources together that make clear to our colleagues, these this is work valued by the in, you know, organizations to which we all belong is, is one more helpful thing that we can do. I don't want to keep you all over time, especially on a late Thursday afternoon, but um, I, it's been such a pleasure talking with you, seeing your faces. I miss you and I hope I'll see you, a lot of you in California at Berkeley. And um, thank you so much. Er, er, uh, we're going to, there are many notes appearing and I can't, I'm like, Pat, I can't <laughs> do it all. I make my students read Zoom. I'll lead the chat out loud and we're in Zoom together. Um, but uh, thanks again to Nicholas. Thank you so much, Aaron and Kylie and Winnie. And, you know, I just want to say, I, I just always feel downright moved by the work that center directors and staff are doing for our colleagues and our universities and colleges. So I just, I just hope you get to feel in your bones how valuable the work you're doing is. And thank you very much for sharing it with us. Everybody take care. Thank Bye. You.